for reaction to the WikiLeaks documents. We're joined now by world-renowned political dissident and linguist Noam Chomsky, professor emeritus at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, author of over 100 books, including his latest, Hopes and Prospects. Well, 40 years ago, Noam and the late historian Howard Zinn helped government whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg edit and release the Pentagon Papers, the top-secret internal U.S. history of the Vietnam War. Uh, Noam Chomsky joins us now from Boston. It's good to have you back again, Noam. Um, why don't we start there, before we talk about WikiLeaks? What was your involvement with the Pentagon Papers? I don't think most people know about this. Uh, Dan and I were friends. Uh, Tony Russo also, who also uh, prepared them and helped leak them. And uh, I got advanced copies from Dan and Tony. And uh, I, there, were several, uh, there were several people who were releasing them to the press. Uh, I was one of them. And then I, uh, along with Howard uh, Zinn, as you mentioned, edited a uh, volume of essays and uh, an index to the papers. So explain, though, how it worked. And I always think this is important to tell the story, especially for young people. Dan Ellsberg, Pentagon official, top secret clearance, gets this U.S. Uh, involvement in Vietnam history out of his safe. He Xeroxes it. And then how did you get your hands on it? He just directly gave it to you? From uh, Dan and uh, Dan Ellsberg and Tony Russo, who had done the uh, Xeroxing and the preparation of the material. Exactly. Yes, did you edit? Uh, did you edit? Well, we didn't modify anything. We, we, the, the papers were not edited. They're just uh, in their original form. What uh, Howard Zinn and I did was uh, they came out in the, uh, four volumes. Uh, we prepared a fifth volume which is uh, critical essays uh, by, ver by many scholars on, on, the, uh, on the papers, what they mean, their significance, and so on, and uh, an index, which is almost indispensable for using them seriously. So That's the you, fifth volume in the Beacon Press series. You were then one of the first people to see the Pentagon Papers. Uh, Outside of Dan Ellsberg, Tony Russo, yes. I mean, there were some journalists who may have seen them. I'm not sure. So, what are your thoughts today? As, uh, for example, we just played this clip of uh, New York Republican Congress member Peter King, um, who says WikiLeaks should be declared a foreign terrorist organization. I think that's outlandish. Uh, the materials we should understand, and the Pentagon Papers is another case in point, that uh, one of the major reasons for government secrecy is to protect the government from its own population. Uh, in the Pentagon Papers, for example, there was, uh, there was one volume, the negotiations volume, which might have uh, uh, had uh, bearing on ongoing uh, uh, activities, and Dan Ellsberg withheld that. That came out a little bit later. Uh, but uh, if you look at the papers themselves, there are things that Americans should, should have known that the government didn't want them to know. And as far as I can tell from what I've seen here, pretty much the same is true. In fact, the paper, the current leaks are, what I've seen at least, primarily interesting because of what they tell us about how the diplomatic service works. The document's revelations about Iran come just as the Iranian government has agreed to a new round of nuclear talks beginning next month. On Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the cables vindicate the Israeli position that Iran poses a nuclear threat. Netanyahu said, quote, our region has been hostage to a narrative that is the result of 60 years of propaganda, which paints Israel as the greatest threat. In reality, leaders understand that that view is bankrupt. For the first time in history, there is agreement that Iran is the threat. If leaders start saying openly what they have long been saying behind closed doors, we can make a real breakthrough on the road to peace, Netanyahu said. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton also discussed Iran at her news conference in Washington. This is what she said. I think that uh, it should not be a surprise to anyone that Iran uh, is a source of great concern, not only in the United States. 
uh, that what comes through uh, in every meeting that I have anywhere in the world uh, is a concern about Iranian actions and intentions. Um, so if anything, any of the, uh, the comments that are being reported on allegedly from the cables confirm the fact that Iran poses uh, a very serious threat in the eyes of many of her neighbors and a serious concern far beyond her region. That is why the international community came together to pass the strongest possible sanctions against Iran. It did not happen because the United States went out and said, please do this for us. It happened because countries once they evaluated the evidence concerning Iran's actions and intentions, reached the same conclusion that the United <coughs> States reached, that we must do whatever we can to muster the international community uh, to take action to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons state. So if, um, if anyone reading the stories about these uh, alleged cables, uh, thinks carefully, what they will conclude is that the concern about Iran is well-founded, widely shared, and will continue to be at the source of the policy that we pursue with like-minded nations to try to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. That was Secretary of State Hillary Clinton yesterday at a news conference. I wanted to get your comment on, on Clinton, uh, Netanyahu's comment, and the fact that Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the king, who's now getting back surgery in New York, uh, called for the U.S. to attack Iran. Noam Chomsky. Well. Uh, that uh, essentially reinforces what I said before, that the main significance of the uh, cables that have been released so far is what they tell us about uh, Western leadership. So uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and Benjamin Netanyahu surely know uh, of the uh, careful polls of Arab public opinion. Uh, the Brookings Institute uh, just a few months ago released uh, extensive polls of what Arabs think about Iran. And uh, uh, the results are rather striking. Uh, they show that Arab opinion uh, does uh, holds that the major threat in the region is Israel. That's 80 percent. The second major threat is the United States. That's 77 percent. Uh, Iran is listed as a threat by 10 percent. Uh, with regard to nuclear weapons, uh, rather remarkably, uh, a majority, in fact, 57 percent, uh, say that uh, the region will be, it would have a positive effect in the region if Iran had nuclear weapons. Now, these are not small numbers. Uh, 80 percent, 70 percent, 77 percent say that the U.S. and Israel are the major threat. Uh, 10 percent say that Iran is the major threat. Now, this may not be reported in the newspapers here, it is in England, but uh, it's certainly familiar to uh, the Israeli and the U.S. governments and to the ambassadors. But there isn't a word about it anywhere. Uh, what that reveals is the profound hatred for democracy on the part of our political leadership and, of course, the Israeli political leadership. Uh, these things aren't even to be mentioned. And this seeps its way all through the diplomatic service. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the cables uh, don't have any indication of that. Uh, when they talk about Arabs, they mean the Arab dictators, not uh, the population, which is overwhelmingly opposed to the conclusions that the, that the analysts here, Clinton and the media, have drawn. Uh, there's also a minor problem. That's the major problem. A minor problem is that we don't know from the cables uh, what the Arab leaders uh, think and say. We know what was selected from the range of what they say. So there's a filtering process. We don't know uh, how much it uh, uh, distorts the information. But there's no question that what is a radical distortion uh, is, or not even a distortion, a reflection of the concern that the dictators are what matter. The population doesn't matter, even if it's overwhelmingly opposed 
to U.S. policy. Uh, this shows up else. There are similar things elsewhere. So just keeping to this region, one of the most uh, interesting cables was a cable from the U.S. ambassador in uh, Israel to Hillary Clinton, uh, which uh, uh, described the uh, uh, as, uh, attack on Gaza, which we should call a U.S.-Israeli attack on Gaza, December uh, 19, uh, 2008. It states that, uh, correctly, that there had been a truce. Uh, it does not add that during the truce, which was really not observed by Israel, but during the truce, uh, Hamas uh, scrupulously observed it, according to the Israeli government, not a single rocket was filed. Uh, that's an omission. But then comes a straight lie. It says that in December uh, 2008, uh, Hamas uh, renewed rocket firing, and therefore Israel uh, had to attack in self-defense. Now, the ambassador surely is aware that there must be somebody in the American embassy who reads the Israeli press, the mainstream Israeli press, in which case the embassy is surely aware that uh, uh, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, Hamas was calling for a renewal of the ceasefire. Israel considered the offer and rejected it, uh, preferring to bomb rather than to have security. Uh, also omitted is that uh, while Israel never uh, observed the ceasefire, it maintained the siege in violation of the truce uh, agreement. On November 4th, the day of the U.S. election, 2008, uh, the Israeli army uh, uh, entered Gaza, killed, uh, invaded Gaza, and uh, killed half a dozen Hamas militants, which did lead to an exchange of fire in which all the casualties, as usual, Palestinian. Then in December, uh, Hamas, when the truce officially ended, Hamas called for renewing it. Israel refused, and the U.S. and Israel chose to launch the war. What the embassy reported is a gross falsification, and a very significant one, uh, since it has to do with the justification for this uh, uh, murderous attack, which means either the embassy hasn't a clue what's going on, or else they're lying outright. Um, 